Messi. You know, it's interesting to think that even at his stage of his life and his career, obviously he was already a well-accomplished and celebrated artist, but he still was experimenting with different media. He still had that, you know, that, that desire to keep experimenting uh, with other themes as well. I mean, uh, for example, what other media was he working uh, with in Cannes? Well, one of the mediums that he worked in very uh, widely was was metal. So there are a number of assemblages of scrap metal that he produced, but he also worked uh, he, to produce a series of monumental sculptures. Uh, you have the Chicago Picasso, which sits outside to the town hall in Chicago, which is one of his most famous. But he also produced a series of like sort of twenty foot tall statues of silhouette for profiles of kind of folded sheet metal. And that was something which a few artists had worked in uh, in in advance. And it's, it is quite important to say that Picasso quite often just appropriated other people's ideas. Um, I mean, one of his great maxims was, you know, good artists copying great artists steal. And he would see an idea and he would, of course, take it for himself. And so metal works became one of those. Uh, but his, that kind of is an extension of his collage work that he was making throughout the early part of his career. Um, even in his cubist works, that was the, the first real experimentation in, in collage. And then, as I've already said, during the, the war years, when he was limited with media, he would work in that again. So everything was available to him. And you know, it wasn't just, he wasn't, didn't just consider himself to be a painter. Do you think that there was something about Khan itself, as in the place, that influenced his output during these times, perhaps inspired him in a particular way? Absolutely. I mean, the, like, the colour and the life and the freedom of it, um, the sort of joie de vivre of being in Provence and having the rural France, and also he's living in the legacy of other great artists before him. I mean, his great friend and rival Matisse had come to the region in the 20s and had created his entire series of arabesques and obelisks, which inspired the later uh, painted series by Picasso in the 60s of the of Delacroix's Fabergés. Like that, that whole narrative is an extenuation of, of Matisse's legacy. Matisse died in 54, so he and was uh, therefore kind of uh, instrumental in promoting that idea to Picasso. And then, of course, people like Cezanne, who was really... Picasso's greatest hero artistically, particularly in his early part, of, early part of his career, looking at Cubism, who had been born in Provence and had retire, retired there uh, and to paint and also we have the great series of Mount Saint-Fractoire and others which, which capture the, the light and the scenery and of course the Impressionists as well had all worked down in, in that area. So he, he was really living in uh, reliving the life of all of his great heroes. And with that, he was able to experiment for the first time and have the freedom to really relish the legacy that he'd already built for himself. I mean, he was the greatest known artist in the world at that point, had been for many years. And he talks as well about being a living legend and having this, having people kind of come pay homage to him and make pilgrimages to his studio. And he was very open to being kind of worshipped as a deity, as it were. So he is, and part of that is this sunshine and the bright light that meant that he could walk around pretty much um, semi-naked and topless the entire time and just have this leathery skin and, uh, and, and yeah, just really just enjoy his life. And I think once you factor in just the sheer amount of enjoyment that he had and the pleasure they took from his work, then you recognize all of that in in the paintings that we see and that survive now and the ceramics and everything else that comes with it. So he was well aware of his status within the art world. Yeah, he was. And it's interesting, there's a duality there and I'm careful kind of how to phrase it, but there was talk from the 50s onwards when you see the shift of art criticism focusing on abstract expressionism uh, in America and this move away from figuration that because it felt like he'd been slightly neglected by the, the sort of the art establishment as it were but commercially he was still by far the most successful artist